So we'll, we were delighted to have you as a juror for the, our show here, Pennsylvania Winter. So can you tell us a little bit about your process, how you, uh, how you go through and separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak? Yeah, but, but first I, 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 I'd like to tell you how unique an experience it is. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in this business for a long time and, you know, as a curator, particularly the type of curator I am, I'm a very much an objects-based guy. And not all curators uh, work as closely with the objects as I do. I'm, I'm, I have a visceral response to works of art. You know, I just, I really like to literally get my hands on them. You know, I, we have uh, uh, a lot of things here that, that we can handle, of course, with gloves and, and things like that. But nonetheless, I, I, I like to get as close as possible. Uh, and that's where I derive the greatest amount of pleasure. And of course, that's how I also have developed a means of uh, valuing or evaluating uh, works of art uh, aesthetically. Uh, and so uh, working from reproductions of images, photographs of works of art uh, is a, a difficult thing for me. It really is because um, it's at least one step, it's often two steps removed from the actual object. Uh, and so not only is it difficult to gauge the work in terms of size and presence, uh, which is a very important aspect when you're going through a museum. It's a very different experience than if you're sitting in a classroom in a lecture. Uh, but also photography really can't reproduce the three-dimensionality of what we normally consider to be two-dimensional objects. Um, you know, a painting, it looks as though it's just color on a surface, but it really has a quality in terms of how if it's an oil painting, how the oil rests on the canvas and how the artist has manipulated uh, layers of that and other layers to create the experience that, that you have when you're in front of a painting. And, and it is a three-dimensional object. Uh, and the same really is true of a photograph uh, because when you look at it, uh, you get a sense of the, the surface and how that surface was, was generated literally by both the camera and the person developing the negative in, in, or in the instance of a, of, of a photograph. And so looking at these and making judgments about the, these objects in this particular show uh, was a difficult thing for me to do. You know, it, it, it got me away from my, my home, uh, the way that I normally approach works of art. For a curator so attached to an object as I am, it, it is a very different experience and a difficult one. Now, wow. getting to the, the selection process itself, um, I'd like to, I, I, I could and, and would love to sit and talk about uh, the theory of, of, of paintings or theory of, of photography or theory of watercolor uh, and, and how artists are supposed to generate imagery. Uh, but every time people talk about that, you find exceptions uh, because there really aren't hard and fast rules in terms of what makes a good work of art and what makes an average work of art. It's a subjective thing. Uh, and I find, especially after so many years of engaging works of art uh, everywhere, um, it's, it's, it's an intuitive thing. So the first thing that I do when looking at works of art is I allow my intuition to really tell me that that object is worth looking at. And there are reasons for that. You know, the, 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 a lot of reasons why an object is appealing. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the quality of the composition. Uh, how well an artist has thought about how she is going to uh, uh, create this image or vantage points. Uh, what, what, what perspective has an artist taken when he's thinking about a particular landscape? Also, there is a question of the medium itself and how well it is employed in order to make the image. And it usually has a lot to do with the experience of the artist, uh, whether or not they are not only well trained in a particular medium, but they have employed that medium in a manner that utilizes the medium to its, 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 its ultimate qualities. That doesn't necessarily mean there's a singular way to approach, for example, painting in oil. Uh, we all know that there's a very big difference between the way uh, academicians, for example, in France during the latter half of the 19th century uh, created marvelous canvases uh, and the way that another group of artists working en plein air 
um, out of doors in the, the 1860s and 1870s uh, used the same medium, the same vehicle for creating very, very different imagery. And so you can utilize uh, uh, these mediums in a lot of different ways, but it always comes down to how well an artist utilizes that medium in order to create his or her vision. So those two things are often come down after I've taken a look at a particular object and it's caught my eye. Then I ask myself, why am I, why am I attracted to this image? Why does that image set us aside? And there's always an answer. You know, there's always something that the artist is doing that makes it appealing. And conversely, those objects that we might set aside uh, in terms of this particular exhibition or, or any exhibition really, is whether or not uh, the artist has utilized that medium in a way that, that is, is special or deserves attention, or whether or not that artist is uh, quite frankly, uh, skilled enough or practiced enough as, uh, as an artist to create a composition uh, that is appealing. And it doesn't mean, again, there's any set way to do this. There are a lot of ways to compose a picture, but ways in which uh, a picture is compelling uh, is another story. So I, so I set six aside uh, as, as, as winners in the three categories. Uh, uh, people, places, and things. And uh, as always, it's, it's, it's never an easy task. Um, but going through the entire group on, uh, I must have done it a dozen times, really, uh, just going through the list and, and allowing uh, really my intuition to, to, to play a role in deciding what, what filters through. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one thing to collect, I don't know, 40, 45 objects out of that group, but it's another thing to really highlight those images. And sometimes you have to really sit down and say, well, you know, which one is better? But occasionally you come across paintings that really stand out. And, and, and in my mind, this is one. Of course, we don't know who the artists are. Uh, but this painting, uh, for my money, is the best in the show. I mean, it's, it's, it's I think, on a level that is distinct from every other work in, in the show. And, and I don't know if that's the kind of thing people want to hear, uh, but there is uh, both a level of, of um, uh, professionality, if you will, or practice uh, in this particular painting titled Winter Pale, uh, painted just this year. Um, and also a great deal of thought, whether or not it's a thought that was created 40 years ago at the start of the artist's career, or something that evolved over time. Uh, nonetheless, both in terms of how the artist uh, wields a brush and how the artist has conceived of this image uh, really is stunning. It, it's a beautiful painting and, and it really deserves the kind of notice I think that we're giving it in the exhibition. Uh, the first part of course is that I think the eye is immediately appealed, uh, uh, attracted to this image because uh, it's, it's a, 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 a very well-painted figure, a, a, a relatively young woman uh, placed against a, 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 a reddish rustic background uh, who has a red hair that, that harmonizes very nicely with a very simple background. Uh, in profile, the head is turned in profile, the body is turned more towards us. But the portrait of this figure uh, in profile, it's a, it's a three, it's a, uh, it's a little bit greater than a bust, uh, is um, uh, it's just really well painted. There's no other way to describe this. The artist actually knows very well how to create within this particular aesthetic, uh, portraiture, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, simplistic use of color is, is, is really, on the surface, but when you look at it carefully, the attraction comes out of how the color is created. For example, if you look at the, uh, the, the sitter's flesh down there, particularly in the neck, uh, the artist has underpainted with a blue tone. And that is a time honor. That goes all the way back really to uh, the Renaissance, if not the Baroque, um, in terms of how artists create the, the, the sense of flesh, the, 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 the dimensionality of flesh, uh, the, the, the tonality underneath the flesh tones and the blue tones are, 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 is blood, you know, it's, it, are, it's the blood vessels. 
And so that underpainting is, is, is done through observation, centuries of observation, and this artist has picked that up. The very simple uh, uh, tunic uh, is, again, deceptively pale, white, you know, winter white, if you will. And if you look carefully, there are layers and striations of, of light blues and greens and grays, almost like if you looked at the snow uh, in the middle of winter would have a very similar tonality. And that of course harmonizes with this rather pale flesh. You know, the flesh of uh, uh, someone who is, uh, whose ancestry derives, derives of course from, from Europe, probably Northern Europe, uh, but nonetheless the combination of the winter flesh, you know, flesh that hasn't seen a lot of sunlight because it is uh, during uh, the, the, the colder months and this, this marvelously wrought uh, tunic is, is just exceptional. And then finally, just in terms of composition, um, there's a diagonal that cuts across the entire figure, uh, not quite horizontal, not quite uh, hor vertical, I'm sorry, uh, and an and antithesis of, of the horizontal uh, from the highlights in the sitter's hair uh, down through the ear and the gesture in the neck. So that curved gesture that is marked by the way uh, she turns her head to our right, and then to the button, and then into the, 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 the gap uh, in the shirt below. Uh, that is a very purpose, a purposeful construct that, that creates a, a nice energy against the horizontal and the vertical that makes it even more appealing. So both in terms of composition, the use of the, 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 the vehicle itself, uh, oil paint, and the rendering of the figure, uh, it really is a stellar composition. Yes, that really is very nice. So, uh, second it's quite small, eight by I'm ten. Sorry, it is. Not... Yes, it, it's it's uh, and this is incredible because it 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 has a a monumentality that belies its size, which is a nice. It's a, actually another uh, nice mark of a, of a of a good work of art. I think. Se second place in this category uh, is this uh, winter holiday children and candles. It's a uh, ink and watercolor on board, which I, is something that I will remark about in a, in a moment. And what drew me uh, to this particular painting, twice the size of the first one, um, is uh, it, it immediately resonated with uh, my understanding of Viennese painting at the turn of the century, particularly artists like Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele. Uh, it's not the same. By any means, uh, I mean it, it, the, the the painting is not as decorative of, as Klimt. Um, it's not as expressionist as Egon Schiele, but nonetheless, uh, there is a shared interest in the surface and the very highly colored and vibrant surface um, of of the of the, the the portraiture, and and in as well as the way that the sitter, this particular sitter, there are three uh, children captured here, but the featured sitter engages us immediately, right in front of us. Um, the, the stare is right at us. And so there is a, 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 an immediate communication between the sitter and the viewer that um, is not rare in painting by any means, but again, reflects the qualities that we see, particularly in Aegon Schiele's work, literally a hundred years prior. And so that immediately drew me to this because you know I have a resonance with those kind of, kind of artists. And, and, and whenever I, uh, uh, see a painting like this, you know, there's an engagement that occurs uh, with between me and this object. And I think it's, it's a, a fairly well painted thing as well. And use of watercolor in a way that is not always typical. And I think a lot of this has to do with uh, the medium. Again, I can't engage this object to tell for sure. Uh, but I wonder whether or not uh, this is a painting, not on a board that is covered with a, a, a paper that is receptive to watercolor, because as you know, watercolor painting, uh, the success of it relies a great deal on the quality of the paper and how well the, the artist, it's a hard medium to, to, to master, it really is, but how well the artist is utilizing uh, uh, watercolor on the surface of that, 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 that paper. Uh, and I think that this might be at least a less absorbent paper or even a board itself that's, that's, that's uh, 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 gessoed uh, or has a ground on it that's, that's not as, absor as absorbent because the, the watercolor pulls in ways that, that are, are, are not as familiar uh, to the traditional uh, 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 practice of watercolor painting or at least 
um, not quite as, as, as absorbent as the paper itself. And so uh, uh, the artist is manipulating watercolor uh, in, in a way that's, that's not typical, but nonetheless, I think very successful. Uh, and gets uh, not a, 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 a highly coloristic, although the, 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 the tones themselves are, are rather muted, but a very coloristic representation of these kids. And I think that the energy that that creates on the surface of the composition matches the excitement of the children um, in this outdoor festival, whatever it is, you know, that and it's obviously some kind of holiday celebration in which uh, they're holding candles, maybe singing carols uh, shortly before the Christmas holiday, if you will. Uh, they're wearing uh, Santa hats, which is a good way. They're bundled up and it's, uh, you have a sense of cold, but you get a sense of excitement about the period as well. And that excitement is generated as much with the energy on the surface of the painting as it is in the depiction of the children themselves. This this take us to places next? From Can do. Now, I'm afraid that the other artists uh, who are working in landscape or are at a disadvantage with me as a judge in this particular instance, uh, because central Pennsylvania landscapes have a special place in my heart. Uh, not only have I been living in central Pennsylvania for, 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 for many, many years, uh, my, my family come from a little bit east of here, uh, over uh, closer to uh, Stratton and Wilkes-Barre. Uh, but um, I, I'm working on an exhibition called Pennsylvania Scenery that is uh, derived of images from the Tavern Collection, you know, the oh, O'Connor mm -hmm. Yeager Collection, uh, the, you know, Jace O'Connor and, and Ralph Yeager, who uh, had the tavern for many, many years, owned it and decorated it with images of, of Pennsylvania towns. And, and people and, and history. Uh, and uh, the Juniata figures prominently in the images that I've selected for this particular exhibition, which is late 18th and early 19th century images of, of, of Pennsylvania landscape. And I mean, this is just a, a, just a, a marvelous depiction of the Juniata. I know the scene well, uh, how, who hasn't taken the train up from, from Harrisburg and it follows this particular path, of course, and you, it's not an uncommon scene. If you, I always sit on the right-hand side uh, when I'm coming up and on the left-hand side when I'm going down so I can get, gain this vantage point of the Juniata. And, and it, it really captures the, a, a, a morning view on a cold day, you see the sun over the hill, and of course, the the Juniata in many places, particularly this place between, or where it's probably close to Muffinburg. I, I can't remember where 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 the artist says it's located, but you know, it's a, a fairly narrow uh, valley, and, and and the artist has 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 not only captured the scene very well, but composed it in a manner that you 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 are are engaged with this river that is characteristic, almost prototypical Pennsylvania. And so I'm sorry, there, there might be other landscapes uh, that are equal in quality to this particular painting. But again, uh, uh, you know, the Juniata, geez, I mean, it's, it's so rich in history and such a, an important uh, uh, causeway uh, for the history of Pennsylvania. Uh, number two is another central Pennsylvania uh, 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 waterway. In this case, that's Fishing Creek. Uh, which I believe is the one that is just outside of Lamar, that passes through Lamar uh, and then goes into Bald Eagle Creek, because uh, there are several fishing creeks in, in Pennsylvania, uh, but uh, with names, Fishing Creek. Uh, but I believe this is through the, the narrows uh, just below Lamar. Um, and, and, uh, and you can see the hill sliding up there, which, which indicates that it's, it is a, a narrow valley uh, through which this stream is, is, is flowing. Uh, so again, central Pennsylvania waterway and, and well known to an awful lot of folks. Um, I was immediately drawn to this very large and oddly shaped trunk in the very center. It, it, was, it, it was almost as if an, a monster was coming out of the, 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 the creek here. Uh, but, but, you know, and, and the, one's imagination uh, takes hold when you when you first see this and you look at it and you, what is it and and then you realize of course that it's a, a large tree that has fallen into to, to the, the waterway. Uh, also, what I like about this is a it's a nice composition. The vantage point couldn't have been easy to get to for the photographer, so I applaud uh, them for this. Uh, but also um, the tonality. Um, this I I I. I um, 
I, I can't, I, again, I don't have the advantage of the object itself. And the artist says it's a scanned film photo. So I assume that the negative, either a negative or a positive was scanned by the artist before it was printed uh, as an image, uh, as a true photograph. Uh, but in the interim, digitally, I assume, although not necessarily, uh, the artist has toned it, uh, given it uh, a, a slight sepia tone that automatically, you see, has a resonance of the 19th century because it wasn't uncommon for photographers to do this, um, either you know, with albumin prints or with salt prints. You know, they often toned uh, the, the, the image. Uh, and so it, 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 it takes us back. And again, it, gets, it gives it a sense, or maybe artificially so, but nonetheless, a sense of the 19th century. So that brings us to things. Things. A barn. And uh, uh, you know, often we see an awful lot of barns when we're driving around central Pennsylvania. Uh, and so the barns themselves may be, uh, maybe not of immediate interest. I think a lot of us, again, and you mentioned this before, we have a tendency to take them for granted. Uh, but you know, this, this, you know, this mail pouch, you know, it's, it's chewing tobacco. And this particular company, um, they, um, they used barns very purposefully throughout the United States. Um, and, and I think it's the entire east, eastern part of the United States, if I'm not mistaken. And they had people go out and paint the barns. They would pay the owner uh, you know, a certain amount to have this advertisement on their barn. Uh, and it was very effective. I think that the company lasted for a century, if I'm not mistaken. So this was a common sight in, say, middle 20th century uh, America and Pennsylvania, you would see them not all over the place, but not uncommon. And so you have this, this, this painted barn. Who knows the last time that this was painted? It, probably at least 30 years ago, if not 50 years ago. Although, you know, artists would come back and repaint the barn every couple of years because, you know, the sun would do damage to the, the image. Um, but, you know, so it gives a sense of a time gone past, you know, of, 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 of not ancient history, but historical quality to the barn itself, partly muted, if you will, in the middle of a snowstorm, which I think is a nice touch. It's a good capture of this image. But what really drew my attention was that spout that runs across the entire side of the barn at an angle that is interesting. You know, it kind of works against this solidity of a block of a barn uh, in an angle that doesn't really match either the roof or the snow line at the space. And so I thought that incongruity immediately drew me and said, what the heck is that thing? And then you think about it, of course, it's a much, uh, it, it was put on that barn probably maybe even 10 years ago, because if you take a look at where it's, it's going, there's no uh, rain collection device on, on our left side of the barn or the barn side of the barn that's facing us. Uh, but on the other side, it's uphill a bit, of course. And so that, that collecting De, uh, device would have had to been collected on that side of the roof and then brought over to the, the downslope part of the barn so that the water doesn't collect on the upstream yeah. side and, and flow into the barn. But why did the owner put it there, right across the image of this historical advertisement? In instance, I, I just think it's interesting. I, I think it's a, a conversation piece and it's something that makes me think. And so I, I, I just kept on going back to this and wondering about it and admiring it. And so just for that alone, you know, it's an object. I think it's an attractive image. It's properly cropped in order to capture just the barn. It seemed to mark the front of the barn, the entrance to the barn. And then the second object is a, is a very different thing altogether. Uh, this image is so unusual. It's so distinct from everything else in the show. Um, it's, it's a digital, crea it, it is an image, a thing, if you will, uh, that is, does not exist in nature. Uh, it's created both in terms of its space and, and the objects that inhabit that space, created out of the imagination of both the artist and generated by a computer program uh, so that it's, it's it's an unusual thing. Uh, and it's interesting just to try to engage this and make sense of it. Because if you 
allow your imagination to play a role. You can actually visualize yourself wandering through this space. And indeed, uh, when I first saw this, my immediate response, again, this visceral response, uh, brought me back about five or six years ago when I was in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts. Uh, you know, their, their, their main building that serves as the, the central part of the, the, to the museum uh, that was constructed, I don't know, I think in the, the actually it's 18, I think it opened in 1876. And so this is marvelous Victorian building, very eclectic in, in, in style. And I was brought down, you know, to the basement of this space and darn if it doesn't look like this because it's very dark space and you know it's a building that's 100 feet wide and 300 feet long and so the entire basement is 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 held up by these these hunks of wood you know these these beams of wood and every once in a while there might be a light bulb a bare light bulb that somebody turns on and gathers in a space amount of space very similar to what's highlighted here in the just right of center and so that it resonates with experiences, you know, and experiences in this instance that, you know, are, are kind of dark and gloomy. It's not a place that I would like to be caught alone, perhaps in the middle of the night or even in the middle of the day because it's so dark. And, you know, you wonder about what lies beyond uh, the, in, in, in the shadows there in the background or what is that light in the background. Uh, and, you know, it has, it has almost a, 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 a a symbolist or surrealist quality to it, where um, your your imagination can can really begin to uh, take hold and be a part of an experience that otherwise you can't experience because it's a space that um, is wholly invented. But not, and I think that's 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 a that's a, a very interesting aspect of a, of a work of art like this. It, it brings you to a place where uh, you know traditional landscapes or traditional uh, 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 imagery uh, can't take you. Yeah, no, it, it certainly does have that sort of, you know, Mad Max meets Frank Furness kind of. You know. Aliens or something. Yeah, yeah well, thank, well, thank you, uh, Pat. This has been a real treat and uh, quite an honor for us to have you jury the show here. Mm -hmm.